Good morning. This is State of the Arts NYC, and this is your host, Savannah Bailey McLean. Today, we have with us in the studio, we have Kyle Bergman, who is the executive director for the film festival ADFF, and ADFF stands for Architectural Design and Film Festival. And joining him is one of the filmmakers. We are so pleased to have Old Khan. Guilfoyle, who will be joining us to talk about his new film, Frank Gehry, Building Justice. So welcome, Kyle and Ulten. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Hi, Savannah. Great to see you. Great. And um, we're in our new studio and, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the nuances of it. So I'm glad everybody was able to make it and we were able to kick off the show. So now, um, Kyle, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about your film festival? Now, I I know that you have been a real believer that there's this blend between architecture and and film, and, uh, and you've been promoting this for quite some time. You've also been involved with various institutions. I believe one of them is called the um, Pacific Rim Park Organization. Mm-hmm. So you've really been engaged with all of this for quite some time, the architectural world. So tell us, what motivated you to really uh, make this a reality? So, um, so, so I am an architect, and mm-hmm. practiced for many years and still practice a little bit. Um, but a number of years ago, uh, as architects, we talk to ourselves all the time, and it's a super interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. But what we're not so good at is expanding that conversation to a broader audience. All oh, right. And uh, film is a great way to do that. And so um, almost about 2000, I started thinking about this project, and we launched it in 2009. So this will be our 10th year. Okay. And now it's the largest film festival in the world about architecture and design. And we do it in New York, uh, Los Angeles, D.C., New Orleans. Uh, this year we're going to add Vancouver and oh, Athens, nice. Greece. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's um, and it's, what we do is we show usually we we preview about three hundred films a year, all on about anything connected to architecture and design, and then we select twenty five to thirty or so, and we put those together in a film festival. And this year it's October sixteenth through twenty first in Chelsea. And uh, we're really, we have a great selection of films. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're super proud to be having the world premiere of Ulton's film, uh, Frank Gehry, Building Justice, which is um, really, it's a typical kind of ADFF film. It both has a design story. Mm-hmm. So anyone coming from the professional design background would be interested. But also, it has a human story. Okay. And we're really, what's important for our selection is not just to get boring architecture films, but they get the films that are really interesting to a wide variety of people that have both that design and and human story. And uh, Ulton's film is just a perfect example of what we uh, typically show. All right, but it's also the subject matter, too. And, and Ulton, I want you to you know jump right on in because this film that focuses on Frank Gehry also deals with a very touchy subject here in this country, and that's dealing with... Uh, prison design and how to improve it and uh, what made uh, Mr. Gary decide to do this and what made you decide to film him showcasing this studio or I should say two studios about this issue. Yes well you're absolutely right that um, it does touch on this uh, Mm -hmm. this issue of incarceration in the United States and there have been many films about incarceration in Mm -hmm. America most notably um, 13th which was a great film about um, Ava DuVernay's film about um, the whole policy issue of, of 
mass incarceration in this country, how it's been a policy issue for 50 years. But, um, but our film, Frank called me mm -hmm. and said he was approached by the Open Society Foundations Okay. Um, who are involved in social justice um, issues around the world. Yes, they and, are. And they, he, they wanted him to look at prison design, jails and prisons, in, as, a, as a way of imagining a future of low incarceration in this country. What would the prisons look like? And so since he would never himself, he'd be the first to admit he would never get a commission to design a prison right. because he's not the kind of architect who designs prisons and, and nobody would ever ask him. He thought the best, of, uh, best uh, most long-lasting effect he could have on this issue would be to get the conversation started in the schools. And so the architecture schools in, in the United States. And so he, because of his relationship existing with SIARC, the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. one of the leading architecture schools on the West Coast, and Yale University, the School of Architecture at Yale, one of the leading institutions in the world uh, on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. He thought if he did two programs there, two studios, it would get a conversation started and it would initiate into the curriculum, the architecture curriculum generally, a conversation about social justice, ju justice issues, but particularly issues around incarceration. Mm -hmm. So so he called me, asked me, was I interested in making the film? And I've worked a lot with Frankie over right. 30 years. And I said, I never say no to Frank, Gary. <laughs> 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 so, um, so I said yes, and we embarked on this program, and we followed his studios. Um, and that's the story we told. Now, um, when he was asked by... Imp uh, by the Open Society Foundations, Frank w said, well, I know nothing about incarceration, so you've got to help me out here. And so they put him together with two people. One was Susan Burton. Susan Burton is a remarkable woman in Compton in Los South Central Los Angeles. Wow. She's a formerly incarcerated woman over a span of 20 years who, when she... Um, uh, you know, fa thought about this issue and, and particularly about how women, the, the tough situation they find themselves in when they reemerge into society. She thought that's their biggest problem is, you know, you get incarcerated for whatever, you know, and there are many reasons why you might get incarcerated in this country, particularly if you're a woman of color. Right. Um, but you get incarcerated, that's one issue, but what happens when you get out? So she started a thing called a New Way of Life Reentry Projects, first by taking women literally from the bus stop and bringing them into her own home because they had no safe places to go. They were thrown out on the street with a plastic bag and $5 maybe and put on a bus and sent somewhere, mm -hmm. often nowhere. You know, their families were dispersed or whatever might their situation might be. So she started this, um, this uh, organization called A New Way of Life. But most particularly, she's active in the area of incarceration daily. She's dealing with people who are incarcerated and, or recently incarcerated every single day of her life. And so, so Frank thought that she would be a perfect woman to collaborate with because she really understood the issue on the, on the inside. Okay. Um, at the same time, uh, he met with Alex Bozanski at Impact Justice. They're a, an incarceration and social justice um, organization in Oakland, California, who deal with incarceration and deal with the issues around poli policy issues around incarceration and how they might be somehow ameliorated over time. And so between all of these people, they advised Frank on setting up these studios, and that's what our film is about. So, um, I mean, because this is a very touchy subject, to say the least, because it looks like the prison systems have become very corporate. So did that ever come into the conversation, the fear that by having this renowned architect involved in at least posing the question that there would be this concern that we would be um, uh, entrenching this whole notion that um, incarceration should be this sort of corporate sort of endeavor. So therefore, um, instead of kind of helping people not to get incarcerated, you're actually kind of encouraging people to be incarcerated because you know there's this whole machine that goes on with incarceration people um get in prisons they are cheap labor for other you know companies um they charge the prisoners 
enormous amounts of money just to talk to families and, and friends. Um, they're kind of exploiting these these people, and we're the only supposedly civilized Western society that has so many people in prison. So did any concerns come up from these um, community organizers um, to Mr. Gary when he was thinking about these studios? All kinds of concerns come up. Um, as James Foreman um, Jr. puts it, um, James is the professor of law at Yale. He's the Pulitzer Prize winning author of the book called Locking Up Our Own, mm -hmm. which is an examination of all of the issues of around incarceration, particularly of black and Latino people in this mm -hmm. country. Um, he says there is no part of the system that isn't broken. There is no part of the system that doesn't need to be fixed. Okay. Every part of it needs to be fixed in order that the word social, the phrase social justice mm -hmm. can actually mean something in this country and All that right. the justice part of it can mean what it's supposed to mean. So uh, there are concerns from top to bottom about about all of this. But when Frank was what Frank was addressing was specifically a future, maybe a utopian future mm -hmm. when there will be an era of low incarceration in this country. So define low incarceration. Well, anything better than what we have. I mean, we've got 2.3 <laughs> okay. we've got 2.3 million people incarcerated in this country. That's we've got a the lot highest of people, yeah. We've got the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We've got 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's incarcerated population. It's mm. an extraordinary figure. And um, and there are moves. I mean, you know, New York for example is a good example of how the prison population has come down. It's come down quite a lot over the last 10 years. But that was due to the fact that they've decided to decriminalize certain activities. There are many reasons why it's come down. It's been a policy change. First of all, locking up so many people is extremely expensive. Yes, it is. And so there's, even on both sides of the political fence now, there's a desire to re reduce that cost mm -hmm. because we, we spend the most in the world. Um, New York is a particularly good example of more enlightened policies um, towards, um, you know, the mass incarceration of people at the front end in jail. If you put a lot of people in jail, then of necessity, even for 24 hours, mm -hmm. a lot of those people are going to end up in prison. And so to try and stem the flow of people into jail is one of the first things. And mm -hmm. in New York City... Um, through Mayor Bloomberg and now Mayor de Blasio, they both both of those had su have had success in stopping or f staunching the flow of so many young people, young men particularly, and young women into jail in the first place. Right. And that's helped. So I think there is some hope, and certainly Open Society Foundations, which is George Soros's um, foundations, which looks at issues of social justice around the world. I think there is co hope and optimism that. The, the, there is a uh, desire across the country to lower this extraordinary rate of incarceration, which makes the U.S. the world's biggest jailer. Yeah. Uh, going back to what I was saying before, one of the, the main reasons why we do have so many people in jail is because they provide an income for other people. You have these huge um, factory-style jails in communities where they don't have any other industry, so the jail becomes the industry, and that's where all the jobs come from. So you need to push people in the jails so therefore others can have an income. And this is a, a vicious cycle that goes on to this in this country. And then on top of it, there's just the whole labor part of it as well. You have cheap labor. And so, therefore, it's almost like a plantation system that you've revitalized in this country. And, you know, I'm a history buff, and I actually do talks weekly about um, the black migration, the Civil War. Just heard a fabulous, fabulous talk about the Civil War and New York's impact on the Civil War and Lincoln and when the South lost the Civil War, they lost their labor force. And they've never kind of recovered from dealing with the fact that they lost their, you know, cheap labor force. Mm -hmm. So this is all enmeshed 
together. And I think it's great that a filmmaker and uh, an architect are working together to really talk about such a sensitive issue that, you know, people don't really like to talk about because we do need to deal with people that engage in criminal activity, but then we need to redefine what criminal activity means in this country. Does this whole redesign open up that conversation a little bit? Yes. I mean, the the policy issues you're describing are perfectly encapsulated in Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. And it was that book that Ava DuVernay made her film 13th about. Mm -hmm. Now, so that's the policy of mass incarceration in, in this country. And what we're looking at, focusing on is if you assume that there is, which of course there is, mass incarceration, um, and you and you think you might be able to lower that number over a period of time, what are what are you going to create to replace it? And it's one thing to buy build fabulous prisons, but on the other hand, if all you do is build fabulous prisons and you don't change the system, then you're not doing any good. So, so the idea, what we're focused on, or what our film is focused on, what Frank Gehry was focused on. Uh, with these two institutions, SIARC in LA and Yale uh, here in Connecticut, was f- as a, as a as a holistic approach, you mm-hmm. you reduce the prison populations, and then you look at some of the models of really great uh, prison systems, like okay. the Norwegian. We went to Norway. We filmed a maximum security and a minimum security prison in Norway. Um, that's gen- they're generally regarded to be the best prisons of the world. If you have to have prisons, you have to protect people from you know doing harm. Um, or, or protect pre- people rather from having harm done to them by criminals, then th- they're a model for how that might work. And so we went and looked at that. Um, because so tell us, uh, before you go further, tell us what makes those prisons different, what oh, makes them it's, unique. It's very simple, really. Mm-hmm. They treat people in prison, the inmates, the incarcerated people, as human beings. They have a respect for their humanity. Wow. They feel that simple. It's that simple. They feel they look for outcomes. They, when a person goes into jail or prison in in Norway, for example, the biggest thing on their file is a date, and it might be the October sixteenth, two thousand and twenty one. That's their release date, and everything they do is working towards that date. Wow. We don't have that in this country. No, we, we nobody don't. Nobody thinks about outcomes in this country, no, let alone successful outcomes in this country. So in our film, we've talked to, I've mentioned Susan Burton, who runs this extraordinary um, organization for women reentering the community. And she's had incredible success with, um, with some of the women, all the women she's impacted. But we also, you know, spoke to a lot of other people. I mentioned James Foreman, the law professor at Yale, who's a radical thinker about about um, incarceration. He's the son of a famous civil rights um, activist, James mm-hmm. Foreman Senior. Yeah. And uh, but now he himself is a, a criminal law professor who is really leading the thinking about this. Um, but we, one of his uh, colleagues, Dwayne Betts, formerly incarcerated, a well-known poet, a teacher. Um, at the La- Yale Law School. I mean, to have him involved in the project was amazing because he, here he is, he's a, a practicing lawyer, he's a thinker, a legal thinker, but he was formerly incarcerated. He was one of those young black men who got mm-hmm. swept up and put in jail and then mm-hmm. in prison for, for reasons um, that we don't need to go into. And um, But but the idea being that, you know, you can have, you, you can try, other people can try and lower the incarceration rate, change the policy in this country, the policies, but in the end, what we have to do is make the prisons somewhat better, somewhat treat people in a humane way, not dehumanize them and um, uh, uh, punish them uh, all the time. Well, there's, uh, there are so many levels of punishment and distress and psychological abuse at every level of the system. And it doesn't just affect the prisoners. It affects the staff, too. I mean, mm-hmm. correctional officers have the highest rates of alcoholism, the highest rates of domestic abuse in, in the country. I mean, they, they are traumatized themselves. So the whole system is built to traumatize people who walk into a prison. So when Mr. Gary was doing these studios, what uh, sort of models were they creating to kind of make it more humane for the people who work there as well as the people who have to stay there? Well, it was quite radical, actually. We, you know, we had these two great studios, one in Syark in Los Angeles, the other at Yale. The Syark one was, you know, um, 
I think they took it really to uh, some extremes in a way by saying there should be no prisons, there should be, you know, everything should be open and if people offend they should be just walking around in the community with tags on their ankles and so on. There were many different approaches. Some of them were fantastic, some of them were a little bit... Um, uh, well, out there, there. Uh, <laughs> very out there and but but that's what students are there to do they, mm-hmm. they really have to explore and um, they were given tremendous freedom to explore uh, the issue from its top to its bottom because it's a very complex issue as you've described mm-hmm. so there are no simple solutions and as James Foreman says uh, every bit of the system is broken so every bit of the system has to be rebuilt and it's all we all have to rebuild it because somehow over the past 50 years, we, every single person in mm-hmm. this country, has allowed this system to be built. And it's going to take the entire country to unbuild it over the next however many years. Well, I, I don't know if we all contributed in creating this system. But I think what has happened, I think people are so afraid of this system. I mean, what do you think, Kyle? I think people are just so afraid when you hear prison mm. that people just run away from the whole ideal of it, how do you um, deal with the people, how do you deal with the, the judges, the, the, the guards, the, all the people that are participating in it, people just run because they're so afraid of one day doing something um, wrong or just an accident and you might end up in this horrific system. So, so I think what, what Alton's getting to is that as citizens that we have to be more proactive in our political system and we can't just let, you know, if we see things that are not going in the right directions, we have to stand up and say things. And I think what Frank Gehry's doing is interesting is, so he's an architect and a designer, so he wants to attack this problem from a design perspective. Mm -hmm. And how can we look at it from that one moment, but also as a broader issue and it brings this attention to the architectural and design community and to a broader community. And by all of us being responsible in the sense we're not directly responsible, but who we vote for, what are you know, paying attention to our election, you know, elections, and you know who's involved with the prison systems, uh, we just have to be stand up and get more connected to that. And when you see the examples from Norway in the film, um, you know, it doesn't look like a prison. The the guards and the prisoners are in conversation and connected. And that's what we have to be striving for, not just in our prisons, but in our society as well. And it was yeah. an important moment for Frank, too, because Frank is famous the world over as an architect of beautiful buildings, mm-hmm. concert halls, art museums, and so on. Um, but what's lost sometimes in that conversation is Frank is a humanist. He's, he's, got a, he's a deeply empathetic person. Mm-hmm. And so what, uh, most architects if they were asked to do something like this, would run a mile. And I just say, I'm not going to have anything to do with this. It's just for the reasons you've just mentioned. But mm-hmm. Frank really took it on. And it's an extraordinary moment at the, at the you might say, at the twilight of his career. Mm-hmm. Um, he's still very busy. He's 89 years old and act, very active. His studio in, in Los Angeles is extremely busy. But for him to do this, to take on this project around incarceration, was an extraordinary um turning point in a way um, at his at this point in his career and of course it's not going to be his legacy but it'll be it's already become an important part of his legacy because the the programs that he did at Yale and at SciArc are now continuing with other uh, professors and the conversation is going around the architecture schools in the country so it is actually having an effect and as Kyle said it's 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 a, a way of getting the conversation into the design community je- broadly um, and to have somebody like Frank leading that is an extraordinary moment, I think. So therefore, it's really about expanding our society because our society has too many layers where nobody is interacting with each other and um, they're sort of in their own little bubble. So basically, um, I commend him for basically broadening our society to tear down walls to say, let's talk about how do we build a better society and that's what I think architecture can do. It can actually not just create walls, but it can also tear down walls, wouldn't you say? Yeah, and I, and I think, you know, this moment that we're living in, this kind of very chaotic political moment, mm-hmm. the, the, the silver lining may come out of it that we as a society are more engaged. And if that's the thing that comes out of it in 10 years, we can look back at this really awful, challenging political situation we're in at the moment and come out later and saying society is more engaged 
uh, that would be a real positive, not just for the prison and our incarceration system, but for society as a whole, because we really all need to step up and be involved. Mm -hmm. And I think the film is really, and what Frank Gehry is saying is that as humans, you know, it's all of our responsibility. Well, I think we need to be more engaged, too, not just mm -hmm. involved. I mm -hmm. think engaged. If mm -hmm. we don't, you know, have dinner together and have a drink together mm -hmm. or ask what's going on in each other's lives, then nothing is ever going to change. We still stay in these little bubbles and we don't get to know uh, each other and we don't have empathy for each other. So what um, are you hoping will be the results, talking about results, at the end of people um, seeing the screening of this film? What do you want them to do? Well, that's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, what, what a film can only do is just uh, shine a light on an issue and or, or a, a person or a number of people dealing with an issue. And so what, what I've tried to do is to show Frank Airy in his unique process, mm -hmm. working with these wonderful people. Deborah Burke, who's the, um, uh, who's the director of the school, uh, architecture school at Yale, who's an architect, well-known architect here in the city. So somebody like Deborah will take her faculty and turn them around mm -hmm. and have them address these social justice issues in a way that perhaps previous faculty um, leaders haven't. So for us, for our film is to show these faculty people, these law people, these extraordinary young stu young people, students, um, and to shine a light on their work and their ingenuity and their brilliance, uh, led by Frank, who is at this moment probably the greatest architect in the world. Well, I just want to thank the two of you for coming and talking with us today. This is this is really amazing. I have to say that I, I've seen other types of um, films dealing with this issue. One was at the, the Tribeca Film Festival this year. It, it brought the entire audience to, mm. to tears. You talk about how in Norway that they have a date on when the person leaves. The only other date that matters in this country when it comes to incarceration is when a person is on death row. Mm. And they were showing this, and I did not know how many women are executed in this country. It was, it was amazing. I mean, everyone was in pure tears because we had no way of knowing this. So I just want to thank you because I think that these poor people who are stuck in these systems need advocates like yourself like Mr. Gary, like Kyle, to shine a light on what we can do so we can change these sad stories into something far more positive so we can have a better engaged society. Hmm. So thank you so much. I look forward. Now tell us, Kyle, when does the film festival begin? So the film festival is October 16th through 21st mm -hmm. at the Cineopolis Chelsea mm -hmm. on 23rd and 8th Avenue in Manhattan. And uh, Olton's film will have its world premiere on Friday, October 19th at 6.30 p.m., and after that screening, Olton will be there uh, with a panel discussion with Wendy Goodman from New York Magazine, okay. and Susan will be in from Los Angeles. That's fantastic. Uh, and then the film will be shown uh, f three other times at the festival on Saturday, um, at, uh, October 20th, and Sunday, October 21st, uh, and you can find all the information at adfilmfest.com, which is on our, our website, um, and it's a, uh, it, it is an amazing film. Uh, I think everyone will be moved when they see it. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I mean, I really had a great time uh, talking with both of you. You're such a well-known filmmaker and also producer. Uh, you've done films with Sidney Pollack. You've done uh, work at the Guggenheim. You've done all these great series. And so this has been such an honor so that I got a chance to meet with you and again with Kyle and talking about these great films and how we can impact our society. The, so, honor, the honor was mine, Savannah. Oh, thank you so much because um, I tell you, um, what I like to do with this show is really try to show all of the arts and a behind the scenes sort of uh, view so that people don't just take it for granted. Like you're mm -hmm. saying, everyone needs to be involved. I think they need to be engaged because otherwise, how else are we going to impact our society? And right now, 
we need to do that more than ever. We mm-hmm. need to change the way people think, their mm-hmm. attitudes. And so this is um, fantastic. So thank you so much. We're going to wrap up this segment, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. So thank you so much. Thanks, Ivana. All right. Italian thing. Okay. I did it last week and it wasn't the problem. Yeah. Um. It saved here. But where did it save it? It saved it into PC documents capture state of the arts. Like you have a whole folder. supposed to start a folder.